If any of you saw the painting that is my background on my desktop for my computer, did any of you notice that, the old man holding the little girl? That's one of my uh, favorites. That's a rendition of, uh, from the George Eliot novel, Silas Marner of Silas Marner holding the little girl Epi that he had adopted. So, and you all know the name Epi means a lot to me. <laughs> All right, if you wish to uh, follow along for our final reading this morning, it is the gospel reading. It comes from uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 26, going through verse 39. And this good news, listen for God's word to you. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, For many times it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now, there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your Holy Spirit continue to abide with us in the midst of worship, and I pray that that same Spirit would grant to me the gift of preaching, that through these mere human words that follow, we could discern a whisper that comes from you, offering this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Monday evening is one of the roughest nights that I've had in a long time. It was was absolutely miserable for me. You see, I had not just one night this week with no sleep. I had two nights. And I was expecting that to be true of Wednesday night for the long drive from Abilene, Texas, back here home to Warsaw. Uh, A trip that, by the way, my father had clicked the trip mileage on the odometer before leaving. And this is quite amazing. I noticed how close I was getting to a certain mark in mileage. And it so happens that from my parents' driveway to Norma Pierce's driveway is exactly 1,500 miles. So just a little, if you figure out the little gas stops I made, maybe it is exactly 1,500 miles from my parents' driveway to my driveway. But I was ready for that because I love that trip. I love all of the podcasts that I download on my phone and can listen to these stories the whole way, and I know what to expect. Monday, my plane was one hour late leaving Richmond. And I got to Dallas, and after five weeks of really having rested this left knee because I want to get back to my morning walks, and I needed to give it time to heal, we were so late landing in Dallas 
that I had to do my, my best to rush, to run, to try to get to the next gate, and by doing so, just completely wrecked my knee again. Got there seven minutes before departure time, but they had already closed the gate. And the next flight was 11 hours away. And it was, it was a miserable night of having to just 11 hours. There's no place to sleep, the hard floors. I have a great idea, by the way. Airports need to have a sleeping room. They, they need to have a place that if that happens to you overnight, that you have a little cot that you can go to and rest. Because I'm telling you, it was miserable. And then finally, 9.30 on Tuesday morning, that first flight from Dallas to Abilene came through. And I got to mom and dad's and was able to stay awake and visit with them until about 5 that evening. And I finally just had to crash to get some sleep to prepare myself for what I knew was going to be a, a, a sleepless night. Now, one of the intriguing things that happened was I found out the reason they closed the gate a little bit early is because they had just kicked the guy off of the plane for misbehavior. <laughs> I'd never seen that before. And so as I realized I wasn't going to get on the plane and needed to go find someone from American Airlines to visit with, this man started making an absolute fool of himself. And he, he was yelling at the ticketing agent that was there explaining to him uh, and it, boy he had a great Texas accent too he's like I don't work for American Airlines you work for American Airlines and if I want to talk dirty on a plane I can talk dirty on a plane and there ain't nothing you can do about it and, and, and I'm and the lady handled herself in a very professional way but uh, then was the hours passed and I was reading the gospel story for this week and it was about a man possessed by demons I thought maybe maybe I had just witness one because the man made an absolute fool out of himself. Well, the situation is, of course, a lot more serious for this demoniac in the region of the Gerasenes. Now, this, this region is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where the majority of the Jewish people had lived. Uh, if you look, if you have the, the maps in the back of your Bible, you'll notice a region called the Decapolis. It's the same area uh, where the Gerasenes are. Uh, Decapolis, it's a compound word. It means ten cities. So it's this group of people from different backgrounds all gathered together. And there was this, this one man, this one man who stood out. And we know because of details in the text that the man did not always behave this way. We're told it would happen from time to time that these demons would seize him, and again, we move quickly to understanding that it's not just one demon possessing him to cause him to act in such a bizarre and dangerous way, but the demon, demons, give the name as legion, meaning many, many demons possess this man. Now, as critics look at this story, you'll find a wide array of interpretations. Uh, there are certainly people that think that when we see demonic possession in the New Testament, that this perhaps would be equivalent to a mental illness today. Uh, so we have some that will see anytime there's demon possessions that it would be some sort of severe mental illness. Uh, and, of course, there are others that truly believe that they are this spiritual embodiment, this dark spiritual embodiment of these demons uh, taking over people. See, you have that whole range of interpretation, and no one's ever going to completely agree on that. You're going to live in a community of faith, knowing that some people think that this is mental illness, some people think this is demonic possession. So since we're going to have that wide array of interpretation, let's look at the more important point of the story. That is the theological or the, the spiritual interpretation of the impact of what's taking place here. Did you all notice how respectful legion the demons are of Jesus? They, they recognize who he is. The demons recognize who Jesus is more so than the people of the area. And they realize the power that Jesus has over them. As Jesus sees this, this poor man, we're never given his name. Can we imagine what his life was like? Again, interpreted in whatever way you choose to interpret. I think we can all agree this man had a miserable existence. Again, the demons didn't possess him all the time. This illness would come and go as it took over his mind and would give him such an incredible strength, almost like we hear uh, law enforcement talk about people who have taken PCP, this sort of superhuman strength would overtake him to where they would actually have to chain him up and no longer living under a roof and a home, but living in the cemetery, living in the graveyard, living among the tombs. And still he would have such great strength that he could break these shackles and cause problems in the city 
and all throughout the countryside. And yet whatever it is that's going on inside of him can see the greatness of Jesus. And the fear that the demons have, that this evil has, is that to not be cast out of this man permanently put down in the abyss, a way of understanding of of Hades or back to hell, uh, that they not be cast to that place. Instead, they they have an alternative. Uh, they, They look to the side of a hill and they see this herd of swine. And it's as if they already know that Jesus is not going to allow them to inhabit this man anymore. He's going to cure this man. He's going to make this man whole and give him a new life. He's going to save this man. And so their alternative is not into the abyss, but cast us into the the herd of swine. And uh, Jesus agrees, as you wish. And so legion, all of him, all of them, cast out of this poor man who had been tormented for so long into the swine. And as you saw, the outcome is not much better. The swine lose their collective mind, go down the steep embankment into the lake of Gennesaret, and they drown themselves. They are no more. And uh, Matt, I may be wrong. I think it was you that said one time, if you were that pig farmer, you'd be awful upset. Because, I mean, that's your herd. I mean, that's your livelihood. And boom, they're all drowned. And I think the crowd would agree with you, Matt, because it says a couple of them run back into the city and throughout the countryside to tattletale. Look at what he did. Look at what he's, how he's just affected our economy, or at least the financial well-being of whoever owns these pigs. And so when the, the townspeople come, come running and they, they find this man that they thought was a crazy fool, someone they despise, someone who was a burden in their community, someone you wanted to distance yourself from as much as possible. And uh, the text tells us that not only did he get the great strength when he would have these episodes, but he would tear off uh, his clothes and he was naked. And when they find him this time, he's calm. He's fully clothed. And he's sitting at Jesus' feet. And the people are alarmed because they had never seen him behave with such sanity and peace before. And as thankful as this man is to have his mental health restored to him or to have these evil embodiments cast out of him forever, as thankful as he is for this salvation he has received, everyone else is so frightened. They've never seen anyone with the power of healing and saving that Jesus has just demonstrated And they show him the exit sign. They point Jesus to the exit and say, go. This is too much for us. This is too overwhelming. There's something frightening about the power you have, and we don't want it here. And Jesus doesn't argue with them. Jesus gets back on the boat and goes back to the other side of this Sea of Galilee to be back among his Jewish friends and his people there. And as he's leaving, this man who has been healed, who's been made whole, he comes to Jesus and says, but I don't want to leave you. Can I come with you? Can I go with you? And instead of agreeing to that, Jesus commissions him, gives him a job to do, and tells him to stay in his hometown and tell people what God has done for him. And I love this last little detail in the story. Jesus tells him, go tell people what God has done for you. And what does the man do? He goes into the town and he tells people what Jesus has done for him. Because there is no way that he can understand what God has done for him apart from what Jesus has done for him. I wonder sometimes if I'm more like the man who has been healed and is so thankful for the salvation he's received through Christ or if I'm more like the crowd who wants to keep Jesus at a distance, who wants to show Jesus the exit sign because it's just, it's too much. And I am afraid that there are days that I'm like the crowd, that what Jesus demands of me What Jesus demands of you is a bit too much. You have probably tired over the past year of me saying being a Christian in America might be the hardest place to be a Christian because the way our faith is often practiced in this country 
is a way of just fitting Jesus in where it's convenient for him to be and not following the radical demands of his saving grace upon our lives. We have a whole lot of pseudo-Christian culture in this country. We have very little committed Christian faith to the demands of the gospel that when grace has saved us, when Jesus has saved us, it has given us a new life, not just for ourselves, but a life to share with others. That's what this man, this man who had been possessed by a legion, who had been possessed by all of these demons, he, he gets it because he was so lost. He had no hope. There was no chance for him. And suddenly in a chance encounter with Jesus, everything about him has changed. It's not just a new lease on life. It is a whole new life. And he's now bubbling over to go and tell people about the love of God. I wonder if people in the town were more welcoming of him now or if they were going to treat him like Jesus. Keep him at a distance. He's a weirdo. What just happened to him, what he's been through, we don't want any part of that. Arguably the most important theologian of the 20th century was Karl Barth. And Karl Barth spent much of his time focused on Paul's letter to the church at Rome. It's Paul's longest letter. And because Paul had not met any of the members of that congregation, Paul gives his most details about what this salvation looks like, is like, received from Christ. As Karl Barth is commenting on Paul's theology, he calls it a dialectical experience. That knowing the saving power of Christ isn't just one small step, one small change, but it truly is going from being a person who is broken, a person who has been defeated, a person without hope, to someone who has been made whole. Someone who has been so changed by God's grace, life will never be the same again. I think the most effective way that Karl Barth put this understanding was that to know God's grace and holiness is to hear the thundering no about what the world has become, become in darkness and sinfulness and to see that there really is no hope, that we're all spiraling out of control in this creation that is so broken and then suddenly to have that experience of no hope and to have God arrive in Jesus and that thundering no is suddenly erased, eclipsed, by this gracious yes from the heavens, that despite how broken, despite how sinful, despite how chaotic this existence has become, that through Jesus, God retains the final word over the entire creation and over all of us, and God's word over you and me is yes that despite all of our experiences of no in the midst of the darkness, the darkness shall not overcome the light. The light has the final word over all of us. That's one small part of what this upcoming week is all about. We know little bits and pieces about what our children and the church family have gone through, what their lives are like, and we know that even at a young age, some of them know the darkness. They've seen it, they've experienced it, but in this place, we remind them of the light. We remind them of grace, and they know that no matter what happens out there in that big, ugly world, they have this safe place to come back to. They have you as their family to lean upon. And that's something for which we can all give thanks. Amen.